first thing we need to do is to go to the Linux from Scratch website. So it's www.linuxfromscratch.org, all one word, Linux from Scratch. And there's the main page. And we need to select the LFS project. You can see the BLFS one is uh, something I'll be doing on another video, um, which uh, allows you to install, as it says, it extends the basic LFS, in, LFS installation to a more customized and usable system. The LFS system is really, really basic. There's not a lot you can do with it. Um, certainly not for day-to-day -day stuff anyway. Um, so let's click on LFS. And if you haven't read about it, I'd thoroughly recommend you read a little bit about it. Um, certainly some of the introductions in the book we're about to get up I'd recommend before you go any further with the video, just read a little bit about LFS if you haven't done so already. Just get get an idea of what what its capabilities are and what it can do. Next thing we need to do is to click the read online link on the side here. So this allows us to read the LFS book online. There's two links here we're interested in. First one is to check to see if there's any errors, any errata in the book, and there isn't any at the moment, which is not surprising because it's brand new, it's only been released a few days ago. So just go back and we'll just click on the stable LFS link and there's the first part of the book. So again, if I start at the very beginning, I would recommend you read these first few um, chapters of the book. <coughs> Gives you some information about the target processors, so uh, and it gives you some information about time and size. I have to say I've noticed over the years that yeah this is quite an old CPU they're using here. It's a, a 4 series CPU. I noticed some of the information they give is not really up to date. It was accurate at the time um, but it's not um, quite as accurate as it is these days. So as I say although it's a 4000 series CPU and i7 if you were to do this on a modern CPU, it would probably take a lot, lot less time, maybe half the time possibly. Build size, again, packages tend to get bigger over time, so you probably find that it's a lot bigger than 4.4 gig for a 64-bit. It could be anywhere up to, up to 5 or 6 gigabit now, I would have said. Uh, prerequisites, uh, gives you some information now on what you need. So part of what this video is, is getting your Windows machine ready, all the requirements. Um, gives you some information on the standards that the book tries to adhere to. Various standards, POSIX standard, the FHS and the LSB standard. And you can click on these links to find out more about them. It gives you all this information. And then it gives you rationale for using various tools that we're going to be installing, why they're needed. So generally, most of these tools are compulsory because core tools, system tools need them. Others are more convenient. For example, Vim is an editor. Don't really need it. Strictly, you really don't really need it, but you'd be struggling without it. So strictly not necessarily, but it's, it's certainly one that's nice to have. Then this page tells you about the typography and how things are presented on, on in the book, uh, what they indicate, so whether it's in bold or not. The bold stuff's what you type in, uh, the commands and so on. Um, stuff inside the grey boxes. Um, you know, it's italicised stuff, it describes all of that. Again, that's worth reading just so that you understand which bits you type into the command prompt, which bits are just for information. And then it gives the structure of the book. The first bit is the introduction of it we're in at the moment. The second part, which is mostly in chapter five, is actually preparing for the build. Um, sorry, that's not that that bit. Sorry, preparing for the build is actually all, it's the bit where we're getting the packages and um, constructing. Sorry, it is yes, it is chapter five. It is the temporary tools. There's two parts to the build. There's a part where you build a temporary working system and we use that to build the final system. So that temporary system is built in part two 
and then the final system is built in part three. And then it mentions the errata, which we've already examined. We know there's nothing that we need to be aware of in that part. And then we get on to the bit about building the Linux from scratch. So here it goes into more detail about the various chapters um, and what we do in each chapter. As I say, this is all stuff that I'd recommend you read offline in your own time. I'm not going to uh, do that here. I'm, this video is purely about demonstrating what you need to do to get get the installation done uh, rather than uh, the background so much. This page has got a list of all the changes since the last build so all these packages have been upgraded and there's one additional package this Z standard which has been added and none have been removed and there's all the changes on that page that have been made and all the links to the um, fixes. Some more resources here if you need uh, there's a FAQ here if you need more information thoroughly worth reading that if you get a bit stuck chances are the problem you've got somebody else has had before is quite a common pitfall worth reading that there's mailing lists which are worth reading um, they also run an in internet relay chat and it's also mentioned there's mirrors here for getting the packages and so on Where to get help, um, what to do if you get stuck, things to mention if you do file a problem, um, compilation problems. It says that you know if you get an error, this isn't enough information to say what the error was. You need to include all this because it gives you some context as to what the error was. Error one can happen multiple times, you know, multiple situations need all this other information to get an idea of what, what the problem was. So that that's worth reading if you get a problem, how to report the problem. So preparing for the host build system. So the host build system, if you're not already aware, this is the live image that we're currently running. For me, it's this De Debian Im image that I'm running. That's the host that we're going to use to build a target system, which is our Linux from scratch 9.1. So host system requirements. Now, this is the bit where I start to deviate from the book just for a little bit, because as I said before, many distributions don't have all the requirements listed here to build a successful Linux from scratch. So what they've got here, they've got a list of all the tools that we must have on the system and the minimum versions. And they've also quite kindly created a script for us to check the versions. So if we highlight this script, now in Linux, although you can right click this and do copy, Linux has a facility where anything you highlight is immediately copied to another clipboard which is made available by center clicking on the mouse. So generally the wheel is the center button. So if I highlight all this script and then move over to the console and center click, I am clicking the wheel on the mouse. You see it automatically pastes all of everything that I've copied. So it's created this script and it's also run it as well. And you can see straight away there's some tools, that there's four tools missing straight away. And we've got an error as well. Same one link doesn't work. Um, yeah, it looks like everything else is okay. So we've got four missing uh, files and one sim link that's not pointing to the correct place. So what my method is to get around this, rather than trying to fetch these tools and trying to remember how to use different tools, whether it's apt, apt-get, yum, pacman, etc. All these distributions have got different 
ways of man managing the packages. What I do is I use a very minimal image from the Gen 2 um, Linux distribution. And what I do is you download that, we extract it, and we do something called Chroot. We, we go into it, and that becomes the root of the system. And that image has everything we need. We don't need to worry about installing other packages and so on. So it's quite convenient. Um, because we're in a trooted environment, and eventually we will need to go into another trooted environment, we have to do a little bit of jiggery pokery to get things working, but it's not a problem. It all, it all works fine. So the first thing we need to do is we'll become root, the root users, to allow us to have full access to all the software and the hardware on, on this system. You can see at the moment it's got a green prompt and the user is just called user. So to do that we do sudo to gain privileges but we're also going to access, access the super user on a permanent basis by doing su and minus. So that becomes the new interactive shell. And I'm this might not be necessary but I'm just going to set a password as well for the root in case it's needed. It probably won't be needed but I'll do it anyway. So I'm just going to put a simple password in there and you can see it's updated it. So what this means now is that we don't need to use sudo anymore to become the root. We can just do su- minus, and it'll ask us for the password. Put that password in and you can see we can become root immediately. That's the only reason why I've done that just in case we haven't got sudo access and we do need to get to the root. Unlikely that it would ever come to that but it's just a little backup. So okay we need to now um, get this little minimal Gen 2 system installed. Now it is really minimal it's just a base it's, it's the um, it's an archive of the Gen 2 system that's used as a basis for building a full, fully fledged Gen 2 system. It's not the live, the minimal live CD or anything. It's just a little, um, what they call a stage three tarball. Um, so if we get another tab open and go to Gen 2 web page, which is probably something like www. Gen 2. I spell it right. Dot org. Yep, so that's the main Gen 2 page. And what we need to do here is to get the handbook. So let's go to get, yeah, follow the install installation instructions. So we want the Gen 2 handbook. So let's click on that one. And we want the AMD 64 handbook because we're building 64 bit. And then if we scroll down here, we need to find the bit where we download the this uh, tarball. So I think it'll be yeah, it's this one here. Installing the Gen 2 installation files. So we're actually going to follow part of this. To, um, to get this table, yeah, download the stage table. So it puts all this information at mount point called MNT Gen 2. So we won't have that because we're not on Gen 2, but we will have the mount directory. There it is, there is nothing in it. So let's create the MNT Gen 2 directory by doing the make der command forward slash MNT forward slash, we'll call it Gen 2 so that we know that's the Gen 2 tarball we're installing to. We can actually highlight this command. As I said before, don't need to copy and paste, just highlight it and then center click in the terminal and that command will work. Um, right, it says graphical browsers, which we've got, be no problem getting 
the stage URL from the download section. So I've center clicked on that link to bring up another tab and you can see we've got this stage 3 here which is what we need to download. So Linux from scratch is not a multi-lib installation it's purely 64-bit or purely 32-bit whichever one you're building on so we've got to guarantee that we select the no multi-lib one so this is the one we want stage 3 no multi-lib so if we uh, let's right click that can we do copy link yeah so let's copy the link we type wget in this window here and then center click to tear to paste that link all right okay so this installation of debian hasn't got wget on it that's not a problem we'll just download it as normal so we'll just click on that and we'll save it and it's going to save it to the default folder in firefox just wait a minute or so for that to download Okay, so what I'm going to do next is open the location to find out where that is. Um, okay, it's not going to tell me there. Downloads. Um, let's see if I can get the bar up. Control. Location bar, that's what I want. Editable location. Okay, so I just wanted to be sure the username was actually called user and it is. So that's the location of that file. So let's copy that, even though I don't need to copy it. So I want to move that file. And I've pressed tab there after downloads. Tab will auto complete because that's the only file in there. It just puts the whole of the file in. I don't have to type anything in. So I'm going to move that file to the current location, which is MNT Gen 2. So that's done that ls minus l and there it is. So that's good. So I'll shut that down, don't need that tab anymore. This is describing how to get the file just from the command prompt and how to validate it as well. Um, should be alright because it's an archive file. If there's any problems with it, the archive would fail. So you don't really need to do, deal with that. This is the bit we need to deal with next is this tar file just copy this exactly as it is and paste that in uh, all right okay it defaults to because it doesn't know exactly what version it puts these stars in so what we need to do is rub out the star after this stage three press tab you'll see it puts in tar.xz their, their example has got tar.bz so we just rub that out just delete that so that's what the full command should be, tar xpvf, the name of the file we just downloaded and the rest should be the same. So press enter and you can see all these files extracting. And what you'll see now if you have used the Linux system before, it's actually created a, a file or set of files that are basically a Linux distribution. So this is the bit we're going to truth into and use that to build the chapter 5 part. Um, so the next bit we need to jump to is the bit that 
we need to, yeah, this is the bit here now. So I've gone on to the next section, about a quarter of the way down, mounting necessary file systems. What we need to do, we need to make the virtual file systems that are in the current running Debian to be made available in this Gen 2 system that we'll be using to install the temporary tools for Linux from scratch. So what we'll do is just copy and paste these commands one by one into the terminal. Okay, so we're basically making the proc file system sys. Uh, I'm not sure what these are. Oh, the dev, yeah, it makes makes that as a slave looks at. And the dev uh, partition with all the devices available in the troop environment. All oh, right, it says there the slave is needed for system D support, which we're not doing. So probably uh, those are probably not needed, but shouldn't affect us. Uh, when using a non Gen 2 installation, medias might not be sufficient. Some distributions make dev shm a symbolic link. So we'll put these in. It does a test, so if it needs to, it'll run that command. And then we can run this one to put a temp fs in. And also looks like it needs to change that device as well. Um, yeah, I think we can just do this true command now. So this is the bit that's going to put us into the true environment. So you see we've got a different prompt now because this is how Gen 2 does it. When you root, you get a red prompt to warn you. Uh, sources profile. And export the prompt just to warn us that we're in a truited environment in case we forget. It could cause us some problems. So now we can go back and carry on if we now um, run this script again, you'll see that we've got no errors because it's using the stationary tarball. And the stationary tarball, I believe, is produced weekly, so it's, it's quite up to date. And that also should mean that all the versions that we require uh, are correct. So, for example, the minimum version of Bash is 3.2. And we've got 4.4, .4, so that's more than enough. And it says bin sh should be a symbolic or hard link to bash. Well, yes, it's there. This is the one that was coming up with an error before, so that works. We'll just check the rest of these now to make sure they are compatible. So, and they should be. As I say, this this image that we've just truted into is is you know less than a week old. Bin utils 2.25, and we've got 2.33. Bison 2.7, we've got 3.1, and there should be a symbolic link to Yak, which there is. BZIP should be 104 or better, we've got 106. Core Util should be 6.9 or better, we've got 8.3. Diff Util should be 2.8.1, and we've got 3.6. Find Util should be 4.2.31 or better, we've got 4.7. GNU awk should be 4.2, sorry, should be 4.01, we've got 4.2.1. And there's a sim link, user bin awk, which is there, that's good. GCC should be 6.2 or better, we've got 9.2. 
glibc should be 2.11 we've got 2.29 although it doesn't say glibc there that is the glibc version for gen 2 there so 2.29 is okay grep should be 2.51a or better we've got 3.31 gzip should be 1.3.12 or better we've got 1.9 so that's good the Linux kernel should be 3.2 or better. We've got 4.19, so that's fine. M4, that should be 1.4.10, and we've got 1.4.18. Make should be 4.0, we've got 4.2.1. Patch should be 2.5.4 or better. We've got 2.7.6, that's good. Perl. 5.8.8 .8 or better, we've got 5.30. Python 3.4, we've got 3.6. Um, Sed 4.1.5, we've got 4.7. And Tar 1.22, we've got 1.32. Text info, we've got 4.7 is needed, we've got 6.6. .6. .6. And XZ. We need 5.0.0 and we're using 5.2.4. And last of all, the C++ compiler works correctly. So there you go. It's it's all it's all up to date and working. So it's just what we need. So we can carry on now and start building this. So again, it goes through the different stages in the chapters. So basically, we're going to do some configuration in the chapters 1 to 4, which is where we are at the moment. We're in chapter 2. Chapter 5 builds the temporary system. So it's like a mini LFS system, and we use that to build the proper LFS system that we'll be finally booting from. So the first thing we've got to do is create a partition and it gives an idea. Um, it, it recommends a 10 gigabyte partition, which is a, a good size. It's probably more than you need, but I think eight gig is probably about a minimum you need, but yeah, 10 gig will be no problem. As you saw before, um, got a 64 gigabyte partition because I'm planning on installing Beyond Linux from scratch as well, eventually in another video. So that's why I've got so much. Um, RAM. It says a good idea to have swap space. Yeah, swap's not such a big deal these days with um, RAM. Is, RAM is plentiful these days. Um, I will create one just, just for completeness, but it's not really needed. If you're uh, planning on doing Beyond the Linux from scratch and you want to hibernate the computer, then you will need to create a a swap file that's the same or bigger than the amount of memory you have because the hibernating image gets written to the swap partition so you'll need to make sure it's as big as your memory or bigger other than that I'd, I wouldn't recommend anything more than you know one or two gig maybe uh, in, uh, there's different schools of thought of this and I'm in the camp that says if, if your PC is using swap all of the time or a lot of the time then it's really time for a RAM upgrade if you've if you've run one command that happens to need a little bit more memory than what you've got installed and it's just like a a momentary thing or just for that one command then and it's you know a quick command then you it's probably just you know just one off it's probably not necessary but if you're relying on swap all the time then that, that that's the point I think we do need to think about getting more memory um, I'd say probably four gigs about the minimum for Linux from scratch, especially if you've got multiple cores running, um, preferably eight gig or more, but four should be enough. In fact, you, you may even be able to get away with less, possibly two. GCC uses up quite a lot of memory when it's compiling, so especially if you're compiling that with multiple cores, you, you might find two is not enough, but I think four would be. So it goes on to mentioning about different partitions. We're just going to create a boot partition, um, a root partition for the system, and a swap file. So 
So let's move on to do that. So this is the bit where I kind of, yeah, don't quite follow the book here because it tells you about creating partitions but doesn't tell you actually how to do it. And it just goes on to making the partition, uh, sorry, formatting the partitions. So what we'll do here is we'll go into something called FDisk, type in minus L, and this shows us the disks that we've got in the system at the moment. And you can see the hard disk or the solid state disk that's in the machine is called dev SDA. Do you remember it was a 250 gigabyte hard disk? And you can see as all the partitions we saw in Windows, three recovery environments, the basic data one, reserved partition, and an EFI system. We've then got a dev SDB, which is 14.3 gigs. Um, this is the actual uh, USB stick that I've booted from. So we don't want to touch that at all because this is the Debian that's running at the moment. And then we've also got one called Loop. Um, and this is the actually the Debian system as a compressed image. So these two are two that we don't want to touch. It's just this one here. So what we do is we type in FDisk. Spell it right, FDisk and then the name of the disk we want to edit and it's best to highlight that just so we don't get any typos we might actually you know press SDC or something which we don't want to do and just get rid of the colon and what that does it runs this um, fixed disk utility on that one disk which is the hard disk if we type P now at the prompt you can see the same as what we got when we did the minus L command, minus L option, see the partitions. And somewhere amongst here is our space that we created, which we can't actually see at the moment. So what we should do is we'll type N for new, and it knows that there's already six partitions on there, so the next one's going to be partition seven, so we'll just accept that default. And it wants the first sector. So you can see the first sector is 340, 318, 188. And you can see that's one sector after the end of SDA3. So you can see that the sectors, they're, they all join up. So the end of that one there, the next sector is the beginning of this partition here. The end of that partition is the beginning of the last, this partition. The end of this partition is not the beginning of this partition. So the the gap we've got is in between SDA3 and SDA4. So we'll, we'll take the default that it's given because it's identified that's the next free uh, sector. And it wants to know the last sector or the size of the partition. So the first one I'm going to create is the boot partition. And that doesn't need to be very big. Um, so we'll create it say 128 megabytes should be more than enough and all this does is hold a kernel so 128 sorry you need to do plus to say you're extending it by 128 and a capital M for megabytes and there it says it's created it the type of Linux file system and the size is 128 meg so now if we do P and enter you can see that SDA 7 the one we just created there it is, 128 meg. And as it says here, the, the, ta the table entries are not in disk order. Uh, you would expect that this partition would be inserted in the middle there. But the problem is if the operating system that is using these other partitions knows that this is the fourth partition, if we inserted it there, it would then become the fifth partition. This one becomes six, and this one becomes seventh, and that could cause a problem with that system, i.e., Windows in this case, from booting. So that's why it hasn't actually inserted it there, and that's why it's not. That's why it's warning us that they're not in order now. So partition seven is not by sectors; is not after partition six, but partition seven actually is embedded somewhere between. Partition 3 and 4.
it doesn't really cause a problem. It's just a bit messy. Um, so it can be a bit misleading if you're looking down here and thinking, oh, partition seven's at the end of the disk. It's not. You need to examine the sector numbers to see that it's not actually at the end of the disk, even though it is partition seven. It doesn't cause a problem to Linux or Windows. It will work. It's just something to bear in mind if you come back and tweak around these these things. So the thing we'll do next is create another partition. So this is partition 8. We'll accept that default. First sector, again, it's identified the next three sector after this one here. We'll accept that. And this time we want to create a swap partition. So I'm going to create a 1 gigabyte swap partition. That will be enough. So plus 1G. And press enter. And it says it's created the new partition 8 of type Linux file system. Well, it's not a Linux file system because it's going to be a swap partition. So we need to change the type. If we do a P, you can see it says Linux file system there. So we need to change the type of that partition. So we do a T, and we want to change partition 8. Partition type, well, we don't know what type it is, what the code is. So we do list, and you can see it lists all these partition types. We need to find, there it is there, Linux swap. So our partition type number is 19. So press Q there to stop that list and just type 19 in and you can see it says it's changed it from Linux file system to Linux swap. If we do P again to print the part partition table you can see again it's got Linux swap there. So the last partition we need to create is the actual root partition where all the data is going to be stored. So we do N for new again. Take the default partition number 9 is the next one take the default first sector and it's also calculated the last sector as well so we'll take that to use up the rest of the space you can see it's used just under the 64 gig which I've allocated and reason why it's just under 64 of course is because we've used 128 meg for the boot partition and 1 gig for the swap partition so just finally print up the whole partition table We've still got our Windows partitions intact and we've now added in three Linux partitions into that gap that we created in Windows earlier on. Finally, these haven't been written to disk yet. They're all in memory. To write them to disk, we do W and press Enter and that's now been written to disk. So we can now do fdisk minus L slash dev slash SDA to view that again and you can see it's definitely written to disk now. So now we can come back to the Linux from scratch book and you can see it's telling us to run this command here to create the file systems. So I'm going to run this command in on two of these partitions on the SDA7 which is the boot and SDA9 which is the root partition. Now be extremely careful when you do this. If you type in the wrong partition you risk overwriting your Windows 1 so if I typed in here SDA3 and pressed enter, I'd wipe out one of these partitions. So be extremely careful with what you type in here. Best thing to do is to copy and paste to be sure. So the first one I'm going to do is the root system. So if I double click that that part there, it highlights the dev SDA7, which is the going to be the boot. If I center click it and paste it in, there's no mistake that I'm not selecting the wrong partition now. No chance of typos and I can see because it's highlighted the line which partition I'm going to format. So press enter, it's formatted that. It's quick because it's really tiny. Not a problem. So I'll recall that command. Rub that out. I'm going to do the same as I did before. Double click the partition name and number for the root partition. So this is just creating the file system on these partitions. Press enter. It takes a little bit longer this one because it's a, a bigger partition and that's done. So they're now formatted. Now we can create the or format the swap partition. So I'm going to get the I'm just pressing up arrow here to recall the previous commands. I'm going to do the fdisk command again just to get the swap partition number up. 
So I'll copy this in, just highlight it, paste it, get rid of the device name and number because I'm going to double click and paste with the center click and that's the swap created as well. Now I can activate that, that swap partition now if I wanted to and it'll be used while we're building. There's no harm in that just in case it's needed. Shouldn't be, I've got I think 8 gigabytes on this machine so it shouldn't need it but no, no, nothing wrong with doing that. So to do that I do swap on and then the, the name of the swap partition so just paste that in and it's activated now. Um, you can do something like cat proc swaps and that will show you the swaps that are activated. You can see slash dev slash sd8 is in use. Another way you can do, you view it is to do top which shows the top process is running and you can see there the swap line, that line there that we've got one gigabyte, sorry the highlight disappears every time the screen updates. There's one gigabyte of swap or 1000 megabytes swap total. It's all free because there's nothing been used out of it so far which, which we, we don't expect. So that's the swap. So the next thing we need to do is to create an environment variable called LFS. Let me just make these a little bit bigger, that's it. Um, this environment variable points to a location where we will be building the temporary file system. And obviously, you might, if you're aware of how these things work, you might have already realized if we create a temporary file system, a temporary Linux from scratch system in MNT LFS here, we're already in the troot. It's not going to be available when we come out of this troot. That's not a problem because what we'll do is we'll move that directory into the correct place when we come out of this troot. So we'll just build it as if this was the, the system we booted from, even though it's it's actually a trooted system. So let's copy that and paste that command. So we've now created a variable called LFS. And you can inspect it by typing echo and dollar because it's a variable LFS. And you can see there's the parameter, there's the value of that variable that we set here. And it says here, don't ch don't forget to check LFS is set whenever you leave or re-enter the current work environment, such as when doing an SU or root to another user. So you'll see a few times I'll do this echo command just to make sure that the environment variable is actually set. If it isn't, it will cause problems. Things will get installed into the wrong place or they might not even get installed at all. So the first thing we're going to do now mounting the new partition is to create this location because it won't exist at the moment. Use that with this command. And you can see it created the directory MNT LFS. And the next command is to mount the root file system at that location. So let's do our FDisk command again. Quick way to find that is if you do Control R and stop typing FDisk it will find the most recent command that had the uh, letters that you type in and there it is there, that's the one sorry no it's not the one let's do that again, control R F D I, yeah that's the one there, fdisk one is L slash SDA so now we've got that we can copy this command paste it in go back and delete the dev xxx and we paste in the root device name which is this one here that's the big one of the two file systems we created that is the root and there you see it's mounted it on mnt lfs so we can now access the space in that partition if you do df minus h you can see that shows us that dev sda9 is mounted on that partition as well. It shows us that 53 megabytes has been used. Well, that'll be system structures, file system structures, but we've got 59 gigabytes free, plenty of space. Next bit, it says that if we're using multiple partitions to mount them as well, well, we are using a, a multiple, uh, multiple partition because we've got a boot partition that we've created 
So what we need to do is create a space for that. So if we type mkdir $LFS forward slash boot, what that does that will create a boot directory under MNT LFS. So let's have a look in uh, LFS. And there's our boot directory. That lost and found is a directory created when we formatted the disk. That should be left there. If there's any corruption, any uh, files that are found will be, be deposited in that directory. So we don't delete that one, don't touch it. So now we can mount, similar to the previous mount command, we can mount onto the boot directory and it's got to be the boot partition which is dev sda 7 so we'll rub this out now I could let's say put in 7 you can type it in but just in case I mistype I'll delete all of that and paste it in and now that's mounted to boot directory as well so if we do df minus h again to see the partitions you can see we've got our root partition 9 the big one mounted on LFS, mount LFS, and the boot partition is mounted on top of that mount LFS at the boot directory, and we've got 110 megabytes free in that one. So that means we've got all three partitions mounted. We've got the boot partition, the swap partition, and the root partition all mounted, all ready to take our new Linux from scratch partition. Uh, it says here if you're using the swap, enable it now. So we've already actually done that one, so that's that's not a problem. 